and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be discussing the moser tardosh algorithm. What is this? Well, it stems from the idea of is there an algorithmic version of the local lemma? So remember that the Lovas local lemma says that under the right conditions, none of a set of bad events holds with positive probability. So we can avoid all of the bad events. And then a natural question is, can we actually find this algorithm, this outcome algorithmically? Can we find it efficiently is a better question. And so you might want to stop and pause and think for a moment about can we even find the outcome? We know it exists, but can we develop an algorithm to find it? And the answer, of course, is yes. If you can say sample from the probability space, then a simple algorithm does the trick, namely, uh, you just keep sampling until you find uh, that it holds, it has to hold with positive probability, so eventually you'll find the right outcome. But this is wildly inefficient, namely because the probability, as we learned before, could be exponentially small. And so how can we avoid this? Can we actually find the outcome efficiently? Well, efficient algorithms with weaker conditions than the local lemma uh, so more, more stringent uh, assumptions about uh, the probabilities were proved by Beck in 91 and Malloy and Reed in 2000. Uh, but then there was a, a very big breakthrough by Moser and Tardosh from 2010 that showed that there actually does exist an efficient algorithm for the general local lemma uh, under the variable model. So you have to be clear about what assumptions you're making uh, about uh, the probability space and such, but for a very natural one that covers essentially all known cases or uses of the local lemma, uh, the variable model, which I'll tell in a second, uh, their algorithm efficiently works there. So what is this variable model? Well, the variable model for the LLL, that'll be my shorthand for the Lovas local lemma, will consist of the following. We're going to have a finite set omega, and for every v in omega, we'll have a random variable c of v. So you think of these as somehow different trials, different random variables coming from possibly different distributions, with the assumption that all of the c v are mutually independent. So you might think they're all different coin flips, but they don't even maybe have to be uh, discrete. They could be continuous. For the purposes of the algorithm, we'd be assuming you could uh, sample efficiently from those distributions. And then uh, we're also going to have an index set i, which will keep charge of the bad events. And for every alpha and i, uh, we're going to have a set a sub alpha of omega and an event bad of alpha in this probability space where bad alpha depends only on the values of c of v, where v is an a of alpha. So for each event, that will be an, uh, a subspace of this probability space, then we're going to write down the a of alpha, the variables that that depends on. So a of alpha is the set of variables uh, which the bad event cares about. So this, this is a natural thing to think that somehow our family of bad events comes from independent trials and that each event depends on some subset of those trials. And indeed, in all of the examples we did before with the local lemma, this was the case. So this is the variable model that somehow uh, the bad events come from dependency on, on these underlying independent variables. All right, we're also going to need some notation. We're going to write P of alpha for the probability of bad alpha, the probability the event alpha is bad. Uh, and then we're going to write alpha sim or, or tilde to beta if A of alpha intersect uh, A of beta is non-empty. So what does that mean? That alpha and beta depend on at least one variable in common. So this is usually what we did to build those uh, dependency sets. We actually took our, our set, the d alpha, uh, to be all the beta that it intersected with as we came. We're usually operating in the variable model. But here I'll just note something in particular that in, according to this definition, we have alpha is related to itself. So it depends on itself which may seem a little silly, but it's quite natural. We just have to be a little bit careful because I, before when we were doing the local lemma, we made a dependency set consisting of other events and not the event 
uh, alpha itself. And so uh, we'll have to be clear when we're doing that or not, taking that into account. So that's the variable model and some notation. Moving on to the actual algorithm. So what is this magical algorithm that's so efficient, that does everything? Well, it's breathtakingly simple. It's the kind of the obvious brute forcey thing to do. It's amazing that it works and works efficiently. So what is the algorithm? Well, first, step one, you sample all the variables at random. So we need some initial state. So let's just sample each uh, possible variable and we'll have some initial setup for our system. Now this could have a lot of bad events. Maybe we don't get the desired outcome and indeed it's probably quite unlikely that we do. But then what we do is step two, that while there exists a bad event, you know, if we don't have a bad event, then we're just done, we get our outcome. So while there exists a bad event, we're gonna try to fix this. How do we do that? The, simple possible, the simplest possible procedure, we go ahead and select one bad event alpha so this is key. We're only going to take one at a time. So just think of one. You can think that this comes from a, a list. You could order all the possible events um, in, in, in order and then take the earliest one. But you select one that's currently bad, just one, and you resample the variables it depends on. So all of the CV where V is in A of alpha, we're going to head, go ahead and resample. So here we're assuming this resampling oracle, uh, that that's efficient if you know if, you, if it's not efficient to, to sample these variables then we really couldn't hope to do anything so we're just going to take that as a black box but we go ahead and resample and then that's it we just keep doing this while there's a bad event fix it while there's a bad event you know resample now you might be unlucky and get the bad event back itself or of course you might create new bad events uh, but we just keep doing this so while there's a bad event pick one resample it while there's a bad event pick one resample it so it's kind of like a whack-a-mole right every Time one pops up, we hit it, maybe others pop up, but we hope that at some point this all ends, and when it does, we proceed to return the output of this state of the system, the, the variables, and that will be our desired outcome. So that's it, that's the simple algorithm, that you, you start with a random sample, and while there are bad events, you take them one at a time, and you, and you resample them, you hope to fix them up. And, and then when they're all, when nothing's bad anymore, you, you're done. Now, of course, it's unclear whether this algorithm really works, does it terminate? But indeed, the key theorem, which we'll try to go through the proof of today, is that the expected number of iterations of the algorithm is at most the following. So this was proved by Moser and Tardos in 2010. Uh, so how does this work? Well, they showed that it's at most, uh, if you're in the general local lemma, in the variable model here, so again, assuming it comes from the variable model for your probability space, that the expected number of iterations is at most the sum over the bad events of xi over one minus xi, so where xi is um, those variables that you picked to satisfy the conditions of the general local lemma. And then if you convert that into what you get for the symmetric version, you'd actually find the expected number of iterations is the number of events, a number of bad events that are divided by d, that dependency factor. So that's actually very good, right? I mean, in some sense, of course, we the best we could hope for is somehow a linear in the number of events, right? I mean, we, you'd think we'd have to check whether the events are actually bad, right? And this is saying, actually, then we can proceed. And once, you know, we, we've done that, then we only need a few, a very few iterations, actually, you know, one over d times the number of events to, to fix them all. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our, our main theorem we'll be proving that you get such good bounds, like not only polynomial essentially in the number of events, but really linear in the number of events, at least if you're in the symmetric case. Uh, how will we do this? Well, as I said though, it's not clear the algorithm terminates, right? If the algorithm terminates, then the output is the desired outcome. And that would therefore be a proof that there is such an outcome and of the local lemma therefore itself. Uh, but the algorithm may not terminate, right? It might have infinite running time. Uh, and so we need to address that. So the big question is how do we actually calculate the expected running time of this algorithm? And so we're gonna show that expected running time are those values, that it's therefore uh, finite. So with probability one, uh, it will actually terminate. It can't, it's measure zero unlikely to go off to infinity, etc. cetera. 
So how do we do that? Well, it's this key idea of log. So we'll say a log L of the Moser Tartosh algorithm at t iterations is the sequence alpha one up to alpha t of the bad events, where alpha i is the bad event whose variables are resampled in iteration i. So this was the nice part that we only picked one bad event to go ahead and fix and resample from. So let's just write down every time we did an iteration which one we picked. So we, we keep writing down and, and we, it might happen that we come back to a bad event uh, and we have to fix it a second time, a third time, etc. So th this, this sequence could, could go off to infinity, could be arbitrarily long, uh, but we're going to keep that uh, as a log. So we're going to write that down and that's going to be the key. So how do we make sense of these, these logs? And we're also going to write t log for the total number of iterations. So we're trying to bound the expected uh, size of the, the, this log of the total number of iterations. So how do we make sense of logs? Well, here's the key idea. We'll call it Moser trees, uh, as Moser somewhat originally came up with the algorithm and then Moser and Tardosh uh, did the analysis. But here's this really nice definition. A Moser tree is a rooted tree TR, so R will be the root, T is a tree, uh, with a map from the vertices of T to the index set, to, to the uh, bad events, right, such that Two properties hold. If u is a child of v, then we're going to have that their images, their labels, so think of phi as a labeling, we're labeling the tree with these bad events. Uh, if u is a child of v, we're going to require that phi of u uh, is dependent on phi of v, so intersects in the variable model. That's what that tilde means. And if u and w are at the same depth from the root r, so think of uh, it's a rooted tree, so there's levels, so there's different depths. So each level we're going to require that phi of u is not uh, dependent on phi w, so that the, these bad events don't actually uh, intersect in their variables. So we're going to have a tree. Children will intersect with their parents, but then across a the level there will be no dependence. It's all be mutually independent. So those are the two requirements, and we're going to define a p of t to be the product of uh, the vertices in T of the, their labels. So we're going to define this as the product of the probabilities of the labels. So it's important to note here that a label can appear many times, and so this will be with multiplicities. So if uh, a certain bad event appears five different times, we get five factors of its probability. Uh, so that's what we'll have as our definition of, of P of T. So for a Moser tree, we have these labels, we have somehow these conditions, and we define a probability coming from the product of the probabilities of those labels. So with all that in hand, now I can explain how this abstract concept of a Moser tree relates to the algorithm, uh, the moser tartosh algorithm and its logs. So namely, we can encode every log as a Moser tree. How do you do that? Well, let L equal alpha 1 up to alpha T be a log. We define a digraph. Uh, I'll write L with an arrow above it where the vertices will be, of course, just the, the labels there, the bad events, the alpha i, these from the index set, i and t. And now I have to tell you the edges, we're gonna put an edge from alpha i to alpha j, so a directed edge, where i is smaller than j, where alpha i is dependent on alpha j, so that they their variables intersect. So we think of a digraph, it's all gonna flow from, from smaller values to larger values, and we're gonna put a directed edge from one from alpha i to alpha j if they're dependent. Okay, so that's just kind of giving you a sense of the dependencies in, in of these bad events. Now we're going to go one step more. We're going to let v be the alpha i where there is actually a directed path p in that digraph from alpha i to alpha t. So what does that say? At time t we have this, this alpha t that we're resampling. This v will be the set of all alpha i where there's somehow a kind of a dependency path. So somehow when we were doing the resampling there, it ended up cascading into more resamplings that ended up in our bad event for alpha t. So that will be v, and then we'll move from there, and for every alpha i in v, we're gonna have to pick a path. So how does that work? We're gonna let pi be the directed path from alpha i to alpha t under conditions. So what conditions? I'm gonna do two conditions. I'm gonna make sure it's longest, so I'm, I'll take the, the longest, windiest route I can get. Again, you're always moving forward in time. 
but I'll, I'll take somehow the, the longest dependency path I can, I can choose. And since there may be many of them, I'll have to break ties. I want to just pick a, a unique one. It doesn't really matter, but uh, for our sake, we'll pick one that's lexicographically minimal, just to be canonical. So pick the earliest point at each point where you can get that longest distance. So we had those assumptions. Now I can tell you how to convert a, a log into a, a Moser tree. So the associated Moser tree of L, this log, which we'll denote as TL, uh, will be defined as the vertices of the tree will be V. So I'm only going to put, I'm not going to use all of the events uh, for my Moser tree. I'm just going to use the events that somehow have some dependency path toward our final event alpha t. So we're just going to be somehow tracking. This will track all of the, the bad events, the, the resamplings, the outcomes that actually affect our, our last one. And we're, as an edge, we're going to, for edges of this tree, we're going to put alpha i, alpha j, where alpha i, alpha j is the first edge of pi. So that was the point. We picked these canonical paths, and then we'll just put, go ahead and put an edge from that path. So what we'll end up doing is we'll end up getting uh, all of the, since all the paths are consistent in this way, with the lexicographically minimal, we'll end up indeed getting a, a tree. We'll each pick one future neighbor to go to, and, and really you'll end up picking up all of these possible paths. So everyone will end up going to the root. So that's our Moser tree. So for each log, we can convert it to a Moser tree. And think not just of the final log, you can do this for a log at each stage. So at after each iteration t, we can make a log. Uh, except I, I skipped a step there. I just said it's a Moser tree. We didn't actually prove that. So let's go ahead and prove that t of l is in fact a Moser tree. So you might want to stop and pause the video and think through why is this a Moser tree. Go back to the definition and, and confirm it for yourself, but I'll, I'll go ahead with that proof. So first, TOL is, of course, a tree by construction. Uh, the way I did it was quite clever. You're only adding in, in one edge. So indeed, you get that forward edge. And since they'll end up uh, creating a path, each one moves on toward the, toward the root. Then we get the tree by construction. So let's not go through that. But what about the other properties? Well, one property was that if I have an edge in this tree, they need to be dependent. Well, that also comes by construction, right? So we put in edges, our edges of the tree were actually edges from the digraph, where we only put those edges in, in if they were dependent. So that part, that first property is fine. We need the other property that the ones at a certain depth are not dependent. So suppose u and w are vertices of our tree at the same depth, d. Then why is it clear that these actually are not dependent? Well, think about those vertices. They have labels. So let's say alpha i and alpha j are their labels, so corresponding to some events. And you could assume without loss of generality, one of them has to appear earlier in the log. So you're going to say i is smaller than j. And then what do you know? Well, if they were actually dependent, then think about how I did this construction, how I did these paths. Well, you know, alpha i and alpha j both had as their longest path a path of length d. Uh, to the root, to this alpha t, but think about what that means, then uh, alpha i would actually have a longer directed path, because it, it could go alpha i to alpha j, because j is later, and then pick up the path of length d. So you'd actually get a path of length d plus 1, which would be a contradiction. So that's, uh, that's indeed our proof, and again, uh, glossing over some details, you should really argue that if you're at depth d in the tree, then you have a path of length d, and that's your longest path and such, but that's, that's obvious from the construction. So we've proved it's a Moser tree. Now where do we go? Well, let Tn denote uh, T of Ln, where Ln is the length and prefix of the final log. So we've converted our, our logs to Moser trees, and where will we go from this? First, I'll just prove you a little lemma. It's not exactly necessary, but it's just nice to understand that if i is less than, than n, then Ti is not equal to Tn. So if I have my log and I think of the trees associated to, to each step, then they're actually different for each step. So I'm never going to find the same tree twice. So why is this? Again, you might want to pause and prove it, but it's kind of obvious. Suppose not. Then you'd have to have that the roots would have the same label. So we mean by the same, I mean in the sense that there's a mapping that preserves the root distance that also does uh, the labels. 
as viewed as, as, as actually from the set omega. So then in that sense, you'd have to have the, the alpha i, which is the root of ti, and alpha n, the root of tn, somehow correspond to the same label. So they're actually equal. They're, they're pointing to the same bad event. But then since the, you know, alpha i, since an event is dependent on itself, since alpha i would then be uh, dependent on alpha n, it, what would it mean? It would mean that every vertex in V of ti is the start of a directed path in ln, this digraph, to alpha n, right? Because everything in V of ti has a directed path out to alpha i, and then alpha i to alpha n is another edge in that digraph. So we, we would actually find that all of the things that alpha i depended on, uh, alpha n will also somehow depend on in these dependency paths. So that means that V of ti is actually a proper subset of V of tn, so they can't possibly be equal, a contradiction. Why a proper subset? Because alpha n is another node in that tree. So that's the proof of that. Then where do we go from here? So then here's kind of our, our key corollary is that of all this is that the expectation of t log, the expected number of steps, is actually the sum of the probabilities uh, that, where you take the sum over all the possible Moser trees, the probability that t equals tn for some n. So what do I mean by the t equal tn? Again, the, a Moser tree, the number of vertices isn't necessarily the length of the prefix, as we, we're going to throw out the ones where somehow weren't in our dependency paths. But so that means we could actually be the tree uh, for different prefixes. But for each specific log, the above lemma said you only uh, were for one such prefix. But I have to somehow sum, uh, think of the probability over all of those, and then sum over all the Moser trees. But I claim this is, is true. It's again an easy proof if you let LF be the final log. It's somewhat tautological that the expectation would be the sum over these. Uh, possible logs of all the possible logs of the size of the log that would be the number of steps times the probability that l is in, is lf which you could then rewrite where you sum over uh, the logs of size n with the probability that ln is a prefix so each prefix i'll count once that will give me indeed the number the length of the log count and then you could write that you could break that over uh, the lns that end up going to a specific tree so i could sum this over t sum over the logs which get mapped to that tree, which we've now made it a canonical, a unique mapping, so that's well defined, and the probability that ln is a prefix of lf, which is what we're writing. That, that inner sum is essentially the shorthand for uh, the above sum up there. So that proves the corollary. So if we could only get a handle, we converted logs to Moser trees, so if we could only get a handle on when do Moser trees show up, what the probability is, we'll be, we'll be on our way to proving the theorem. And this is what our next theorem says. We'll show that this probability that a tree actually uh, appears as, as coming from the log is actually at most P of t. So that's where this nice P of t definition, where you product all the probabilities of the labels, it becomes useful because essentially that's the probability that this tree will, will show up uh, as the tree for one of our prefixes of our final log. So you might want to pause for a moment and think how you would prove this, but you know we're going to have to use the, the assumptions about the Moser tree, the properties of it, and the mutual independence of the, the various variables. So that's why we're doing this again in the variable model. So what's the proof? Well, essentially if you break what this statement is saying it's break it down it's saying that if tn is equal to t then that means that the backwards component in the digraph where you, over the whole log starting at alpha n is precisely uh, what you get it's going to be precisely the component um, v of tn so it's going to be precisely uh, the set v of tn which again is not all of ln uh, but just the 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 backwards component uh, where all the things on the dependency paths. So that's what we're going to have to look at. So it would hence suffice to upper bound the probability P that the backward component of alpha N is actually uh, V of T N. This actually gives rise to this tree. So that seems a bit complicated, but when you think about it from that, that you're somehow just wondering, okay, if I take for granted that I'm actually got 
this this certain tree, yes, there might be other parts of the log, but essentially those will go away and I'll, I can just look at the probability that I actually first got this kind of sub part of the, the log, this part that actually gave rise to D. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's go through. So you have to track all the various variables. For V in omega, we're gonna let CVI, so remember CV are these variables, I'm gonna let CV with a subscript I denote the variable at the beginning of iteration I. So we're gonna track it through time. And of course, these could be equal if they're not being resampled. But what does that mean? It's important I, I tell you when in the iteration, because remember, we might resample them in the middle of an iteration, so I'll say it's at the beginning of iteration I. And then for every I, we'll let A of alpha I subscript I be the variables in A of alpha I at time I, so at the beginning of iteration I. So, so what's gonna happen in, in step I, I'm going to resample these variables, so let's write them down before I resample them. And that's what the A of alpha I is. It's the state of the variables before I went to resample them, which means the state was bad. The state of those led, led to us doing the resampling. And then the big claim is that all of these, these uh, variables are actually mutually independent. So, you know, each, bad, each time we go to do a bad event, we have a set of variables that are telling us it's bad. I claim, though, the way that the tree is built, that these are actually mutually independent. So somehow no variable in our log is using, uh, no event in our log is using the same variable. No two events are using the same variable for their badness. So let's prove the claim. So how do you prove the claim? Again, you could pause it and think through this. It suffices really just to show that for different i and j, that these, these the, the variables at that time before they get resampled uh, depend on different samples and or variables. So if they just depend on different variables, that's fine. Or if they depend on the same one, that they depend on different samples of that variable. So the i.e. that we resampled one of them. And now it's straightforward, because without loss of generality, you could assume i is earlier, that i is less than j. And if alpha i and alpha j don't depend on each other, then this is just obvious. So we could assume without loss of generality that they are dependent, but then they have to be at different depths, right? That was one of the properties of the Moser tree, that these actually happen, at, that everything at a depth is um, not dependent. And then that would mean, though, that Alpha, a of alpha i was resampled in step i as desired, right? So it means that actually we, we did the resampling of it and then uh, it was free game for a of alpha j to use. So that's, that's somewhat the key here is kind of you can think that every, uh, every depth of the tree is independent, so those will just all be fine. And then we're kind of resample in time and so then we'll actually be fine uh, for any later uses, since we'll have done a we'll have a clean slate, clean variables for those to use. Okay, so now we're we're basically done with the proof of the claim. We now have to finish up the proof of our lemma. Again, the probability that A of alpha i yielded the bad event alpha i. So it has its kind of private suite of variables coming in and they had to be in a state where it's bad, that of course has probability p of alpha i. And since these are all independent by the claim, we find that the probability p we're looking at is at most the product of these, again with multiplicities, which is by definition p of t. So that proves our claim that the probability that you know t is some tn is at most p of t. And so as a corollary, we get the expected uh, t log, the expected number of iterations is at most the sum over Moser trees of this probability of this Moser tree, the, the P of T. Okay, so where do we go from there? So we're almost done. We've upper we've converted logs to Moser trees. We upper bounded the number of, uh, expected number of iterations by the sum over these probabilities of the Moser trees, but it's hard to get a grasp on what the probability of a Moser tree is. So what we'll instead do is we'll, we'll weaken the notion. So we'll, we'll generalize a bit. We'll be a little bit more flexible so that we can count more better, more efficiently. So we can actually do a count. So a weak Moser tree will again be a rooted tree TR. Again, we'll put labels phi from the vertices of the tree to our index set I. We'll again have the property that if U is a child of V, then they have to be dependent on each other. 
But we're going to weaken the second condition. Instead of assuming that everything at a depth is not dependent, we're just going to assume that if u and w are distinct children of a vertex v, then that they're actually distinct. Uh, so we're going to assume that the labels are distinct. So basically, uh, we're going to forget about over the whole depth, and we're just going to look at a particular node. Its children have to be uh, different events that it depends on. And one of those events could be, of course, itself, uh, but they otherwise are, are, are really uh, different events that it depends on. Now, we don't know which ones are actually present in the possibilities, but we're just going to take that into account and say, we'll go over all the possibilities. So here's now what we're going to do. For every alpha and i, we're going to define the following variables. We'll let t of alpha be the set of weak Moser trees with a root labeled alpha. So that's potentially you know, infinitely many, all different depths. And we're going to define w of alpha to be the sum over the p of t, where t is in t alpha. Right? So we're hoping the sum is, of course, finite over all trees. So here it's just the trees where the root is alpha, i.e. that the, the last event set, resampled is is actually this alpha. And so what is this really giving? Well, w alpha essentially would be the expected number of times you would think the event alpha uh, was resampled by the algorithm. So that's quite natural to study. And then we're going to let t d alpha be the trees in t alpha of depth d. So we're going to now stratify that out by the various depths of these trees. And we're going to have w d alpha uh, be the sum uh, of those probabilities for that depth. And so now if, if you do this work, you can actually quite easily make a recursive formula uh, for, the, for these weights. So it's easy to see that w0 of alpha is p alpha, and I claim that for every d at least one, w d alpha is actually p of alpha, the probability of alpha, times the product of its uh, dependencies of one plus w of d minus one beta. So you put in a one plus uh, here's where we're using recursion. We're going to have uh, one smaller depth of used but for uh, beta. And so, again, you should note that, that that product includes alpha itself. So I could keep having alpha onward uh, in its, its um, formula there, but again, this is for a fixed D, so it'll terminate. And so the proof of this, the first statement's immediate from the definition. If I'm depth zero, uh, I only have one vertex. We know it's label, it's p alpha, so the product's p alpha. So that's immediate. How do you do the other one? Well, basically the second statement follows since both terms are equal to the following. p of alpha times the sum over subsets of beta, uh, where beta is dependent on alpha. So you take over the sum over all possible uh, subsets of the dependent uh, neighbors, the product of uh, over those beta of w d minus one beta. So why is that? So basically you can think in a tree, so I have some possible number of children, uh, so dependent children, so that will be my set S. I'll say I'll only look at trees where that's my set of children. And then for each of them, uh, we need the product of the probabilities over those subtrees, uh, of all the possible subtrees there, well that would be w d minus one uh, beta, subtrees of, of depth at most uh, d there. And so note this includes a term for the, the alpha, uh, and then we're, uh, we're basically uh, uh, done there. So again, it's clear that you'd sum over all the possible subsets of children uh, to get the left-hand side. To get the right-hand side, what do you have? Well, you'd end up, uh, if, you, if you work out the subsets, you can just rewrite it in essentially in the same way as you do the binomial theorem to get one plus. So for each child, do you want its tree in there? Then you put a w, uh, d minus one beta. If you if you don't want it in the set, you put a one. So you just kind of leave it uh, empty there. You put a one, which doesn't affect the product then. And so if you product it out, all the various cross product cross terms will lead you to these various subsets, depending on which are one and which are not. So let's not go through that. You can just think about it. But indeed, we get this very nice recursive formula for these w. And now we're almost done. So here's our, our, our last pitch. So I claim this nice theorem that if for every alpha in I, uh, that's the bad events, if there exist uh, x at alpha in zero up to one, and uh, not equal to one though, such that P of alpha is the most x at alpha times the product of beta dependent on alpha, not counting alpha itself, of one minus x beta. So this should be familiar. These are precisely the x size we had in the statement of the general local lemma, 
uh, again, the same bound on their probabilities. So if we have the basically the condition of the local, the general local lemma, we claim then that W alpha, which is the number uh, the expected number of times that alpha is resampled, is at most x of alpha over one minus x alpha, which will be some fixed constant. Uh, depending on this x, and again x is not 1, so that new uh, denominator is also not 0, so this won't be infinity, it will be some, some finite constant. And hence, uh, our expected number of iterations will be, which will be the sum over all the trees, and w alpha was when each tree was alpha uh, as its root, so you get this, the e of t log is actually the sum over the alpha and i w alpha, which will be from the statement above, and most the sum alpha and i of x alpha over 1 minus x alpha. So this is our, our, our glorious last theorem. We have built up all this work where we uh, looked at uh, logs into Moser trees, their probability. We wanted to then count those probabilities, so we upper bounded them with weak Moser trees. And so indeed now we're claiming the weak Moser trees satisfy these nice formulas from the recursive formula and thus we've upper bounded the expected number of iterations. So let's prove that last step. So how do we use the formula? Well, we'll show that for every alpha in i and d at least zero, that w d alpha is at most x alpha over one minus x alpha. So we'll say all of the trees up to depth d uh, indeed satisfy this formula. And hence, when you look at the limit, um, which as, as go arbitrarily large, then since each of them will be small, the whole limit will be small. So we're not going to gain any more trees. So we're going to get the W alpha is at most X alpha over one minus X alpha. And then how do we show that statement? You do it by induction on D. So by induction on D, if D is zero, then W zero alpha is, is P alpha, which of course is at most X alpha, if you look at uh, the definition there. And then what else do we have? Well, for d less than or equal to 1, we have using induction that w uh, d alpha is actually uh, p alpha uh, from our recursive formula times this product where beta it depends on alpha, including alpha itself, of 1 plus w d minus 1 beta. And now you just do a substitution. By induction, w d minus 1 beta is at most x beta over 1 minus x beta. So you get this uh, nice product formula, then you simplify that. Well, if you one plus x beta over one minus x beta just becomes one over one minus x beta. So just cross multiply and think about that. And then you're basically done. Why? Because remember P of alpha was at most x alpha times the product of the one minus x betas uh, for all the betas that's not alpha. So we end up that basically all of those will cancel. We're left with an x alpha, but we did not cancel out the uh, when beta was equal to alpha, so you're going to get a 1 minus x alpha on the bottom, uh, which is indeed what we wanted to prove. And so that, that concludes the proof of that theorem. So again, here are the algorithmic implications for the general Lovas local lemma with the variable model. The expected number of iterations is the most this sum of the xi over 1 minus xi. And for the symmetric local lemma, since the xi we chose to be 1 over d plus 1, uh, 1 minus 1 over d plus 1 and, and xi if you, on top, they'll end up canceling out to a nice 1 over d. You get that for each event, so the expected number of iterations will be the number of events over d, which again is linear in the number of events, so that's quite nice. So that concludes our lecture for today. We talked about the moser tardish algorithm, this big breakthrough. So every time you go to really use the local lemma, assuming it works in this variable model, there's indeed an efficient, really linear time algorithm uh, to do it, the algorithm is strikingly simple. You know, you just sample and you keep resampling a bad event while there's a bad event. You just fix it, you know, just keep trying. And this analysis, this detailed analysis with the Moser trees and the weak Moser trees nicely shows that indeed this, in expectation, the number of steps is quite small. So that concludes our lecture for today. Uh, until next time, see you then.